Hello and welcome. I'm Brian Bailey, Technical Editor for Semiconductor Engineering. I'm continuing my talk with David Abercrombie on the subject of advanced lithography and double patterning. David is the Program Manager for Advanced Physical Verification Methodology at Mentographics. In part one, we talked about who needs to be concerned with double patterning and the basics of coloring, including some of the flows being supported today. In this second part, we will be looking at more advanced coloring, including what to do when you get a color coloring error. I started by asking David why someone would be concerned about what colors are assigned to specific objects. Yeah, why would you want to control the coloring of these, these things? Well, actually in most cases, uh, early on when people started going 20 nanometers, the first people that did, they were completely concerned about that problem. They felt like, I, I need to control this uh, entirely. And why would, you, why would you care? Well, in a single patterning mode that we're used to, when you're printing the green shapes, you print them all at one time. So whatever the distance is between them is consistently that distance on the wafer. When the reticle, when the image is shot on the wafer, the image may misalign, but every shape in that window shifts together simultaneously. So they always remain equal distant from each other, even if there's a misalignment in the photo tool. Once you split them onto two wafers, you're now doing two image processes. So you'll first align and print the red ones, then you'll align and print the orange ones. Now that second alignment may not be in sync with the first alignment. So they can shift relative to each other. This space may get smaller um, and in this direction it may get bigger, for instance. Uh, and clearly from a parasitic extraction standpoint you can imagine that would, at least in some minute way, affect the capacitances between the shapes. And that's what everybody was concerned about and why they said they, they wanted some way to control it. Now, in actual experience, what we found people done a lot of tests and experimentation, especially in like digital design, usually the impact of this is uh, very low uh, and you don't have to account for it other than probably adding some additional corner variation in your simulation model to kind of account for it in general. You just assume a little more variation overall and that's, that's not too much over constraint on your layout to go to the trouble of trying to control it. But I think if you were an analog designer or had some really high speed uh, situation or, or I think in more cases something like a matched circuit. So if I'm trying to have a, a matched pair or matched uh, configuration of, of devices, you know, normally even in the traditional layout, if I've got a set of shapes on a layer, I'll say like this, an analog, that these are supposed to match these. And clearly one thing you control today is you make sure the dimensions of these are exactly the same as the dimension of these. Uh, and they're mirrored exactly. That's one thing you already work on today. Uh, and in analog design, what we typically see is the space between things is much larger than in the digital part of the layout. So uh, from a multi-patterning standpoint, what we typically see in analog is that these are far enough apart that actually they could be on any mask. It really doesn't matter. Uh, so it seems simpler. I don't really need to worry about what color because they could be any color. It's not going to constrain what I can draw. However, the problem in that case may be that if you let the fab randomly assign them, since they could be anything, I may do this. That's a legal answer one of many legal answers. But, given the misalignment between masks, I'm going to get a different capacitive variation on this set of shapes than I am on this set of shapes. They no longer match. So that might be a case where I would want to control it. So what impact does this have on the tools and flows that people are using today? Um, well, first of all, there's uh, impacts on methodology. You know, how am I going to design my chip? The first question is, am I going to do it colorless? Am I going to try to anchor things or not? What things do I care about? What things do I not care about? These are decisions you have to work through, and that's why I say you need to prepare for these nodes. How do I want to uh, manage this? Um, you know, you've got to 
learn about the two masks, whether you've got to generate the two masks or not generate the two masks. In terms of tools, uh, definitely you're going to see on the design creation tool side, uh, tools and applets and capabilities in those tools to help you if you are trying to color them yourself, to assign colors to them and generate those GDS layers. Uh, but more importantly, in the verification tools like DRC and LES and extraction, uh, the information about the colors and whether or not it can be colored and how that uh, attention needs to be captured in extraction, you're going to see new capabilities in those tools that deal with those specific topics. So you will see extensions in the tools uh, for 20 nanometers and down for those things. Uh, and particularly in the physical verification, what I've shown you so far as an example here are all things that can be legally decomposed. These four shapes, like I said, there's more than one correct answer, but there's a correct answer. Um, where it gets a little more interesting is when it's not legal. Instead of four shapes, I draw three shapes. Okay? And let's say these are too close to be the same color, and those are too close, and those are too close. Okay, they need to alternate. Okay. So I'll, I'll pick red. I'll put this one on red. Well, if that one's red, then because of this, this has to be orange, right? And if because of this, this has to be orange. But wait, those both can't be orange. Uh, that's not legal. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll make this one red. Well, no, those both can't be red. They have to be opposite color. Uh, this is referred to as a, an odd cycle. Uh, and there's no way to legally color an odd cycle because you're dividing an odd number of things by an, an even number of divisor. So what would a designer do in this circumstance? Okay, that's the interesting thing. And that's a new thing they need to learn. Uh, if we think of spacing rules normally in DRC, you draw two things, if they're too close to each other, you get an error. Spacing violation. Okay. There's basically one, well, there's two possible fixes for this. Move them farther apart, or get rid of one of these. That, that's, your, that's your options for fixing it. Okay. Uh, and you know exactly which one to do. It's your only choice, uh, which is a good and bad thing. The, the focus of your effort is very well localized. The downside is, let's imagine there are a bunch of other shapes around these things. I have to change this one. And the ripple effect from that could be tremendous uh, in terms of what I then have to move because I had to move that. So it's nice that it's local. It's bad that I have one and, one on, one and only one option of what to do about it. And that can have a big ripple effect. In an odd cycle, it's kind of the opposite situation. No individual space here is bad. Only the combination of having three is bad. Okay. So, uh, on the good side, if I want to fix this, I have many options. I can increase this space, and now both of those could be the same color. And I can make a color all three. Or, if that was hard because there's some other shapes up here, mm, I don't want to do that. I want to move this one. Okay, well, I can increase this space, and now those could be the same color, and this would be legal. Or, no, I want to do this one. This one's easier for me. Great, I can change that one, and it'll also be colorable. I have many options for fixing it. Uh, I'm not tied to a particular one, so I can do the one that has the least amount of ripple effect in my design. But this is still very much a manual process? Uh, Yes, uh, in, in the same way that this is. I mean, uh, even if you design the whole layout and you get to the last two shapes and you put them in and get a spacing violation, unless you're using a compaction-based design creation flow or it's, it's being created in automation, it's up to you to do the fix. You, it's going to ripple effect everything you just did. And the human's got to do it. And it's really no different with this. But I, as I said, the beauty is, at this point, you're stuck. You've got to undo maybe the entire set of things you just did to get back to this point to make it work. And this, at least I got an option. Maybe this one's easy to move. And I'm, I have more, more potential things to understand. 
The issue becomes, how does the verification tool display this error to you? Okay. Uh, and the first thought people have, well, just color it. Color it and show me which ones have an illegal spacing. Okay. Well, that sounds good. You get one answer like you got down here uh, between two particular spaces. The downside of that is, well, why did I pick those two to be the same color? Yes, that is an invalid coloring, but I could have colored them red, red, orange, and now the arrow would have been here. Or I could have colored them orange, orange, red, and the arrow would have been right here. Any one of those is equally wrong. Okay? Just like in the four case, any one of them were equally right. These are all equally wrong. And as you can see, depending on which one I choose, I choose to show you, I focus you on a particular location to fix. If I show you this one, you focus here. If I show you this one, you focus here. If I show you this one, you focus here. And as a verification tool, there's no way for me to pick which one of those is better to show you than another. It's completely arbitrary. And it may just happen to turn out by sheer probability that I choose to show you this one, and this, this has the most ripple effect possible. You have to undo 40 shapes you drew because that's hard to fix. Okay. So this has been kind of the big debate, in the first big debate in double patterning is do I design it with looking at the colors or do I do a colorless error reporting? So the first thing we worked on with the foundries and said, this looks inefficient. This doesn't look optimal. Is there another way to show you this error that leaves the flexibility in your hands to choose? Uh, and what we came up together working with the foundries was a different type of error marker. We call it basically an odd cycle ring. So it's like a donut. It's a path essentially being shown. It's, a, it's empty in the middle <laughs> from this drawing. And what the path does is it traces the path from polygon to polygon to polygon that's creating this odd cycle. So as you move from point to point, wherever it touches a polygon, that's, one, that's a polygon involved in this where it jumps between polygons, this says here's a spacing value that's small enough that requires opposite coloring. And it moves to the next spacing, to the next spacing. And in one error, you see all the polygons involved and all the spacings involved in the error. Does that make sense? Uh, so by showing it to you this way, I haven't shown you any colors. Because any color I show you would be wrong. And it would be an arbitrary selection. I just show you this and say, you choose, whatever is easiest for you. And you can then decide, if you decide that this is easiest for you to do, and you increase the space, the error goes away. Okay. This spacing constraint still exists, and that one still exists, but this one is now broken. So the coloring tool at that point, if it colored it, would definitely make these two the same color. They may be red or orange, but they'll be the same color, and this will be the other color. Uh, and that's a legal coloring, because these can be the same color. In the final part of this series, we will talk about triple and quadruple patterning, EUV, FinFETs, and other considerations for the future.